And looks like Russia will be getting an economic boost while the U.S. is still struggling in an emergency situation, you could even call it. So, usually when there's an emergency, you call 911, right? Well, if you're a big bank, you call the Federal Reserve, and they come to the rescue with $9 trillion. That's what happened in 2008 at the height of the financial crisis. So, why are we just finding out about this now? Well, because it was done without congressional approval, without disclosure to the public, and somehow without breaking any rules. Peter Schiff, president of Euro Pacific Capital, is in Westport, Connecticut. And Peter, this is being talked about as overnight emergency loans. Overnight meeting, suddenly and behind closed doors. What do you think here? Is this really just par for the course when it comes to the way this system works? Unfortunately, and you know, you say you're not, they're not breaking any rules. I actually think that what's going on is unconstitutional, but unfortunately, the judges don't enforce the laws that exist. And, you know, in your promo, uh, you posed the question, where did all this money come from? Well, it came from thin air. The Federal Reserve just creates it and bails out uh, banks. Uh, this should not be done. I mean, if banks are insolvent because they've made bad loans, they should be allowed to fail. Creditors of those banks should lose their money. They made the mistake of loaning money uh, to banks that were doing reckless things uh, with those loans. We, we have to have market forces disciplining the credit markets. We can't have the Fed coming to the rescue with a printing press every time somebody gets in trouble. But, Peter, I'm sure you've heard this argument. It's been floating around out there that, hey, these loans were a needed lifeboat to keep the economy from drowning. And, you know, everyone's back on dry land and the loans have been repaid. So, is there anything really wrong with this? We're still drowning. Now we have more water. We're drowning in a deeper pool. You know, these, uh, th this credit didn't save the economy. It saved Wall Street bankers. It saved their bonuses. But the economy is still drowning now in more debt than it was before. And we're going to have a much bigger economic crisis in the United States sometime in the next several years than the one that the Fed believes they averted, because the next financial crisis is going to be a sovereign debt crisis, much like people are facing now in countries like Greece or, or uh, Ireland. And we're also going to have a currency crisis, a dollar crisis. And so ultimately, the American economy American people are going to suffer much more because of these bailouts than what would have happened if there were no bailouts. I don't know about you, but anytime I hear a number over, I don't know, a couple hundred million, I get confused. It just all sort of sounds the same to me. So I want to, I want to remind people, we're talking about $9 trillion. And I just want to, uh, we found a little demonstration of just what $1 trillion actually looks like. Thanks to the current bailout, trillion is the new billion. When you look at it, it doesn't seem all that big, but it's a huge number. What's the economic impact of a trillion bucks? Imagine this. For a trillion dollars, you can buy a $3 latte every day for 900 million years. A trillion dollars is greater than the Australian GDP. It's enough to buy up every stock on the Toronto Stock Exchange. With a trillion dollars, you can fund the militaries of all the NATO countries combined. Gosh, all of a sudden, $700 billion bailout suddenly seems like pocket change. Uh, but, you know, I want to bring this up. The loans that were, that were made, they were made through a special loan program set up by the Fed in the wake of the Bear Stearns collapse. Uh, that was back in March of 2008. To keep the nation's bond markets trading normally. So why have rules when there are so many other rules to get around them? Well, that, that's part of the problem. The government creates one set of regulations, which create problems, and then they try to set... They create other regulations to try to counteract the damage done by the earlier regulations. And, of course, the markets find ways to circumvent them. But the problem is the damage done by the initial set of regulations. And, you know, in, in the clip that we just watched, you talk, we, you're, you're talking about how much a trillion dollars can buy, you know, how many cups of coffee. But if we keep on doing what we're doing, pretty soon a trillion dollars might only buy one cup of coffee. Oh, gosh. Um, I, I want to actually... It won't be all. It might just be one bill with a big number on it, the way they have them in Zimbabwe right now. And, and let's talk about this. I might, let's talk about the almighty dollar. It's no longer just mumblings behind closed doors. Even Paul Volcker, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, is saying the dollar is losing its strength. Well, duh. But that it could actually... I think it's lost its strength. <laughs> it's not mighty anymore. Now... The reason it hasn't collapsed is because it's still on life support. It's still being propped up 
uh, by foreign central banks all around the world. If the dollar was still strong, it wouldn't need those supports. It could stand on its own legs, but it can't. Uh, but I, and it seems like a lot of other countries, though, are, are talking about abandoning the dollar, that, that it's no longer going to be the benchmark anymore. Well, it, it, it won't. It's only a question of time. You know, just recently, if you're talking about Russia, Russia and China came to a trade agreement in which both nations decided that going forward, they will no longer invoice each other for their respective goods in U.S. dollars, that payments will flow between the two nations in rubles and RMB. And that's just another step away from the U.S. dollar. Certainly a huge step. I, I want to take a second now and contrast the, these loans, the information about these loans coming out. Contrast that with what's going on right now. We've got Congress right down the street arguing about extending unemployment benefits for those Americans who are without work, without income, and yet these big banks, the wealthiest companies, and by the way, many of them to blame for the economic avalanche, all they have to do is make a quick phone call and all is fixed. What message does this send? Well, it doesn't send a good message, which is why we shouldn't have bailed out Wall Street. We should have let uh, banks fail. We should have let investment bankers and and traders join the ranks of the unemployed instead of propping them up with big bonuses. But two wrongs don't make a right. Just because we bailed out Wall Street doesn't mean we keep extending unemployment benefits in perpetuity, because these unemployment benefits act as a barrier to jobs. Because when you make it very lucrative for people not to work, they prefer unemployment to work. And unfortunately, the jobs that are available right now in our economy are very low paying right now, and most people would rather get an unemployment check than work hard for low wages. And we have to stop that. Unfortunately, people need to return to work, even if it's not a very good job at the moment, because we need that productivity. And maybe if they take a low paying job now, uh, six months from now, a year or two, they'll be able to get a higher paying job. But if we keep subsidizing people to stay on unemployment, those higher paying jobs are never going to come back because we're going to destroy our economy before it happens. Certainly a lot of information coming out of these new reports, some shocking numbers. Peter Schiff, president of the Euro-Pacific Capital.